Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to another episode of the Creative Confidence Podcast. Uh, my name is Ariana Allensworth. I'm a senior design lead at IDEO, and I'm your host for today. Um, I'll be in conversation um, with IDEO's Lauren Collins and Harvard Business School professor Francis Fry on important aspects of leadership today and how to leverage those skills to empower others. Um, I'll introduce them both in a moment, but first wanted to invite all the folks joining us today to let us know where you're joining from in the chat. Um, and a reminder to change your chat settings to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your message. Um, at the end of today's conversation, we'll also have some time for audience Q&A. So feel free to surface any questions in the chat along the way, um, and we'll um, consider those for the Q&A portion of the conversation. Um, with that, let's introduce our panelists. So more about Lauren. Um, Lauren is Chief of Staff um, to the CEO and Senior Design Director at IDEO. Um, with a strong background in global strategy and business design, Lauren serves as a trusted partner and advisor to the CEO and global executive team while helping advance and operationalize leadership decisions across IDEO. Additionally, Lauren leads IDEO's global change management team chartered in stewarding IDEO's culture to be centered in equity and belonging. She also oversees the advancement of IDEO's global justice, equity, diversity, inclusion commitments. Welcome, Lauren. Thanks, Ariana. And more about Francis. Um, Francis is a professor of technology and operations management at Harvard Business School. Uh, Francis's research investigates how leaders create the conditions for organizations and individuals to thrive um, by designing for excellence in strategy, operations, and culture. Her widely viewed TED talk on how to build and rebuild trust um, shares a powerful framework and crash course on stakeholder trust, how to build it, maintain it, and restore it when lost. Francis is the best-selling author, author of Uncommon Service, How to Win by Putting Customers at the Core of Your Business. She and her co-author, Ann Morris, published their second book, Unleashed, The Unapologetic Leader's Guide to Empowering Everyone Around You in June 2020. Welcome, Francis. Oh, thanks, Ariana. Hi, hi there, Lauren. Hi, good to see you. Too. Great. So um, let's dive in. You know, as a as a senior design lead at IDEO, you know, I've had the privilege of designing for equity and belonging. And through that work, I've had opportunities to learn from Lauren and Francis. Um, and I've had such inspiring conversations with them both about what it means to be a human centered leader, um, and especially during these challenging times. Um, and so that that's what makes me super excited for today's conversation, um, where we'll be talking to them about how to lead by empowering others. So in today's conversation, we're gonna to touch on what it means to be a leader today, why soft skills are more important than ever, and also which ones you should focus on, as well as some tangible ways to practice um, some of those key leadership skills. Um, so Lauren and Francis, you know, because today's conversation is about human-centered leadership and the importance of building up others as we lead, I'd love to begin by getting your take on leadership today. Um, could you tell our listeners a little bit about what it means to lead, be a leader today and what does success look like um, in the leadership space? May, may I start, Lauren? Certainly. All right. So... Um, we usually think we have a definition and orientation, but it really does help ground us that leadership is about making others better. So leadership is not about us. Leadership is about making others better, first as a result of our presence and in such a way that it lasts into our absence. And so the, the really the difficult parts of that is that you could be a leader, like you're assigned as a leader, but when you're acting in a self-distracted way, you're not participating in the act of leading. We are only leading when we are centered on making others better. And it's okay to be required to maybe micromanage a little bit, but our real goal is to equip people and empower people so that they can um, continue to be awesome in our, in our absence. 
Francis, I like that you kind of put that air quote on leader because it makes me think about, you know, there is a difference between leadership and management, right? Management is just getting things done through people. But to your point, leadership is about that environment you create for people to really perform their best. Um, and when we think about, you know, what requires people to perform their best, it's it's about whether or not they feel like they belong. Do they feel like their contributions are actually valued? You know, do they feel like their leaders actually hear and understand them? So as a leader, I think it's always important that you take on that responsibility of making sure people can bring, you know, their most authentic selves to the workplace. It's so good, Lauren. And you also, um, so if, if I'm a manager, I may not necessarily lead. And if I'm an individual contributor, I may lead, right? Because mm -hmm. we can, we can do it. It's great. That's great. Yeah, it's important too, because if you're not creating that environment where people feel like they belong, they're probably spending a lot of energy on the wrong things, frankly. They might be more focused on filtering themselves. They might be more risk adverse because they're nervous of saying certain things. And so um, it's important that you can try to create that environment that people can, you know, again, be their authentic selves. If I think back to especially younger in my career, when I, I wasn't um, a structural leader, if you will, like I am now. I spent so much time in meetings kind of calculating, to be honest, um, whether or not I was going to participate, especially if I was in a meeting where I was the only person of color or the only woman or the only millennial. Sometimes I was representing all of those identities <laughs> in one meeting. Um, you know, I would look to the, to the other leaders in that room and see if they were going to give me signs that it was okay for me to participate, okay for me to take risk. And and again, just like be my authentic self. And if they weren't giving me those signs, then frankly, those leaders weren't getting the best version of me. And so it's really important for leaders to think about that environment they're creating, because again, if you're not doing that, people aren't creating, they're not innovating, um, and they're not helping you turn your vision into reality. You know, that reminds me of in Harvard Business School, 50% of every class grade is uh, class participation. And there'll be some people who for like you were, were self-censoring, looking for a cue. And the most common thing they would tell me after they did that, had I known that that's all that was required to make a good comment. <laughs> so, <they were. laughs> so for sure, when people are self-censoring, that we're losing the good stuff. Yes, um, mm -hmm. absolutely. You know, and what I appreciate about both of your answers so much is that um, it's also really speaks to, I think, the, the importance and growing importance of of soft skills and empathy in leadership, which I think is often a um, not as centered or is often overlooked in, in like what it means to be a successful leader. And I think you both are really lifting that up in the examples you're sharing. Um, and the challenge, you know, of the last 18 months have like brought that the past 18 months have like brought upon organizations, um, I think have really led leaders to um, have to shift to using more soft skills um, in service of regaining trust with their communities, um, strengthening their culture, you know, helping their team members um, show up as their best and fullest selves. Um, and I'd love to, you know, think about, um, you know, how you all have seen this play out um, in the context that you're a part of and what skills are really needed of leaders now, um, given this kind of unique context we're navigating. I can jump in, Francis. Awesome. <laughs> um, thanks for the question, Ariana. This is such an important question uh, because I think soft skills are not recognized and rewarded as much as they could be in business. And as you mentioned, as we've seen over the past couple of years, they have been critical to determine leaders' success. I mean, this has really been the differentiator between the leaders that um, really, frankly, have stood the test of these times and those who haven't. Um, getting into the specifics of some of those skills, the first one I think of is resilience. So the past couple of years, the pandemic uh, certainly at minimum has continued to cause disruption and chaos and uncertainty. And it's really the leaders that could maintain some type of stability in the midst of all of this um, that have helped their organizations and helped their teams um, really move forward. Um, another one that I think of, as you mentioned, is really important is listening. And I've seen that, especially at IDEO, I personally had to really lean into that soft skill, um, especially in the U S last summer, after George Floyd was murdered, we had a lot of conversations at IDEO around race in the workplace. And it was very clear 
at that time that we couldn't continue business as normal. We had to stop. We had to be reflected. And honestly, the best thing that leaders could do in that moment was to listen, listen to their communities, listen to their customers, listen to, um, you know, their clients and really understand um, what people were dealing with in that moment and what a lot of us have been dealing with for years and how that is and was impacting us in the workplace. Um, mm -hmm. And that meant sitting in a lot of discomfort as well. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, what I love about that, Lauren, the resilience and the listening are spot on. And I couldn't help but thinking that some people needed to listen more than others. So even in particular, if we take, you know, after George Floyd was murdered, I would say that it was up to white leaders to listen to the struggles of people who felt that this was not the like a, a soul tragedy, but a repeated tragedy and to really get in touch with that. And so I think I think the skill of listening and maybe the skill of skill of resilience was probably universal. The skill of listening, I think, was probably based on the uh, privilege that one uh, that somebody had. You know what I would add to that great question, Ariana, um, is that for me, and it has to do with um, building and and re maintaining and restoring trust. And I liked how you said that. I I usually say building and rebuilding trust, but I like building. I'm gonna now for now on say building, <laughs> maintaining, and restoring. Um, I I think a lot about if if I'm going to earn your trust. You have to believe in my authenticity, my logic, and my empathy. And those words, I think people, most people just nod when you say it. But it is, um, as Lauren alluded to, <clears throat> it's like really hard to be our authentic selves. Like we're taking cues from everyone else in the room of whether or not it's a good idea to bring our authentic self forward. So I think that it's, but if I can bring my authentic, if you get a sense of my authenticity and you get a sense of my rigorous logic, and you get a sense that I am centered on you with my empathy, a lot of things are gonna go much smoother. We find that in the presence of trust, which happens when that's there, things go much faster and the quality goes much higher. So for the three skill, what I would add on to resilience and listening, I would add authenticity, logic, and empathy. And I mm -hmm. think with the, those fabulous five, Lauren, I think people might be all set. <laughs> <laughs> I love those. I want to add in a couple more oh, though. <laughs> good. All right. Let's go to the seven. <laughs> you know, when you were, um, you know, mentioning, uh, rightfully so that there were some folks that had to listen, uh, disproportionately more than others, especially over the past couple of years, I think there was also a vulnerability and a humility that was really required of leaders in these moments. Um, you know, my dad always says like the smartest leaders have smarter people around them. And I think, um, some of the soft skills and frankly, just some of the um, some of the professional skills around equity work that required over the past year, it required a lot of our leaders to step aside and let other leaders, um, you know, take center stage in that moment, maybe people who weren't you know, and structural power as leaders, but they certainly were leaders in that work. And so that required a humility um, for a lot of leaders to say, like, I actually don't have the answer. I don't know the right thing to say or do right now. And the best thing I can do is make space for other people to step up. Um, so that humility and also just being vulnerable enough to be like, you know, I think often as leaders, we think we have to have all the right answers. We have to say everything perfectly. And just because you're at the top, the buck stops with you. But I've shown the most respect um, for leaders who are like, I'm not really sure. Let me get back to you and or let me find the right person to answer that question. What's really cool about that is when you had the, like if someone steps aside and lets someone else take center stage, I thought you were going to the person who takes center stage might be vulnerable. And so we want to do what we can, but you're, you're, you have a really lovely version of it. It's a step aside is an act of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, that's really cool. Um. I, and I think as like as a as a follow up to kind of this question and conversation around um, soft skills, I'd love to like double click and get specific a bit on on some of the practices and mindsets you lifted up just now. Um, you know, y'all are bringing up such rich examples of um, the importance of resilience and humility and deep listening. Um, as like core dimensions of what soft skills look like in practice, um, but I'd love to think through what some tangible examples are of those things in practice. Like what are some things folks can begin to practice to really build these skills today and incorporate them into their contexts? 
I'll start with empathy as with some pro tips on being pragmatic about empathy. So if I'm going to center on you and I want you to experience me centering on you, I have to make the internal decision. Am I going to offer you my attention or my distraction? Mm. Honestly, we are making that micro decision with everyone we interact with. And if there were someone hovering up above, they might see demographic tendencies associated with who we give our attention and distraction to. It might be structural hierarchy. It might be mm -hmm. people who are like me. It might, it might be all kinds of things. And so I think the first thing we have to do is remove the demographic patterns. And um, when we're in the presence of other people, the more we can offer our attention, the more we're going to create an environment where empathy is included and that we can have trust. Said differently, if I offer you my distraction, it is going to be very unlikely that you're going to trust me. But you know what? It's super tempting to offer you my distraction because I got so many other things going on and I want to multitask, thinking that that will like be more efficient. But if I don't earn your trust in this moment, meta, it's not going to be, not. I didn't mean Facebook meta, but, but in, the, in the large, I'm not going to be more efficient because I'm going to have to do all of the rework uh, with you. So I would say the attention and distraction is a big one. And the biggest empathy killer um, is our phone. You know, we bring this device that at this point has been designed to be addictive. I mean, at this point, it's designed to lure us in. Um, and so we have to fight against that in every meeting we're in. We have to resist that. So I often advise people, uh, technology off and away when you're in a meeting. I haven't met people who have enough willpower, um, and they sometimes don't even know they're doing it. But if every time we offer someone our distraction, we reveal we're not centering on them, we're revealing that we're not interested in their trust, it's a pretty, it's a pretty big cost. But if on the pro side of it, um, offer your attention when you're in the presence of others. Francis, this is one of my favorite things that I've learned from you, especially because I am the ultimate multitasker. And I think the <laughs> pandemic has changed our phone to just to screens, right? So if I'm on a Zoom meeting, I've got Slack open, I've got my text box open, I've got all these things open. And to your point, I am um, in a meeting with someone, but I'm distracted because I'm doing other things. And so one of the things that you taught me early on or shared early on was turn your camera off if you can't be fully present in that meeting. And that honestly has changed a lot of my relationships um, because I can be honest with people and say, Hey, I'm going to have to be audio off. And, you know, they're not taking that as me being distracted or disoriented or not paying them attention because, um, frankly, I can multitask. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I can, you know, just use that mute button when I need to and, um, and, and talk to them, uh, when I can, uh, to build on this, Ariana, and to answer your question more specifically, we talked about listening as being one of these important uh, soft skills. As a leader, listening is very important, but you also have to recognize you can't assume people are just going to come tell you as a leader, as their leader, you know, how they're feeling, whatever feedback they have, especially if it might be hard to hear feedback, you have to be intentional about listening as a leader. If you're trying to empower others um, and what that looks like in practice, it could be as simple as asking someone, what do you think? <laughs> How do you feel about this? It's inviting that um, feedback. It's inviting their opinion into the conversation. And if you're running an organization or maybe you have a bigger team, if you want to be more routine in your listening, just having regular dialogue sessions with the team or the community, again, just to stop and tell people, hey, here's a moment to capture feedback. Um, you know, how are some of the decisions impacting people? What's going on uh, in people's work that needs to be surfaced? You have to actually create space to practice that skill as a leader we found in some organizations even the act of me asking lauren what do you think might feel too direct like we're not yet ready for it mm -hmm. and so the it, it, the level zero version of that is um asking can you all can you articulate an alternate point of view oh i like that talking about it this way you don't have to own it it's can you can you do it? It separates you from it. And I find in meetings, if you do that a few times, it really op it widens the space that people can discuss, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to if you don't do it, first few people agree with each other and the meeting might as well end because you're just going to, nobody's going to want to be the person who moves us off the false optima of that early convergence. Mm -hmm. 
That makes me think of VTS. Ariana, aren't you taking that? Uh, is it visual thinking strategies or visual yep. thinking skills? Strategies, um, yep. Strategies. And so this is a way of like looking at an image or looking at something. You continue to ask questions, Francis, like what more can you see? What more can you see? Um, mm-hmm. And it's just like widening up the aperture of all the different possibilities on the table. Yeah. Um. Well, in a moment, we're going to uh, transition to getting some questions um, from the audience, but I'd love to um, continue around this thread around like tangible skills and examples. Um, one thing I appreciate so much about the examples you're offering are that so many of them are such like low lift, but high impact practices that are like just super accessible and don't require um, a big lift to incorporate, but can really um shift the tone and energy um, in the space that we hold with folks as leaders. Um, So I appreciate the the accessibility of like the the examples y'all are offering. Um, uh, I guess I'm curious, um, you know, as you, you know, as listeners think about how they might bring some of the tips you're offering um, around uh, deep listening and like presence um, Mm -hmm. that you're offering in the examples. Um, I'm also curious about like, what pitfalls um, leaders should avoid kind of when trying on or practicing some of these tangible examples you're offering or what might be some of the like hidden costs or trade-offs of, of not incorporating them right into our, our practices as leaders. Mm-hmm. Will you start that one, Lauren? I feel like I'm, if I can riff off of you, I feel like better <laughs> things will happen. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. My, my first thought uh, was, you know, we, we, I think we've all been told in lives, like think before you speak. Um, and I think this is really important for leaders to realize, um, especially when you're opening up some of these conversations around dialogue, it's, it's important to create that container and have psychological safety in that space. But you have to remember that you're still a leader. You still hold structural power in that conversation. And your opinion is going to, um, to many people might feel more like fact or might feel like the final word. So um, again, I would say starting with listening, making space for others before you actually lean into the conversation is really important for leaders. You also need to find ways to demonstrate and communicate to people that it is okay, like Francis said, for them to have alternate opinions. So if someone, the first person who offers, you know, an alternative opinion to yours as a leader, you kind of shut them down or you snap at them or you, um, you know, you find a way to invalidate their opinion. You just communicate it to everyone else. It's actually not okay to disagree with that person. Um, so just being mindful of, again, like the power and authority that you hold in that conversation is probably one of the biggest watch outs that I would say for leaders. And I, I like the, we've all been told, so we'll, I'll stay with that theme. Um, I think we've all been told at some point to treat others as we would like to be treated. And I think that's one of the most gigantic pitfalls. Um, uh, we That works really well when we're around people who are just like us. When we're around people who are just like us, they probably do want to be treated just like we do. But the more variation there is between me and the people that I'm around, the less likely that that's, that, that is to be right. And so I think they call it the golden rule. And I just would like to remove the sheen of the of the golden rule. I think that, mm-hmm. and use the listening and they, and Lauren, there's real curiosity that comes out of your listening uh, with the way you talk about listening, but you're, use your curiosity to figure out how others want to be treated and then center on that behavior. And how we want to be treated is a pretty terrible starting point, I think um, in most in most cases. Yeah, I think connect to that too, Francis, like when leaders are trying to be inclusive, one of the things you can do, and or it could be seen as a pitfall if you don't do it, is just be curious about who's not in the room and who's not in that conversation. So if you're in a moment where you're making a decision or changing plans that might impact other people, literally just look around the room and see who's not represented there. Um, You know, you're making decisions about future ways of working and hybrid work. Are there parents in the conversation? Are there caretakers in the conversation? Um, Are there homeowners in the conversation? Just kind of take that inventory. Um, We can look at some of the pitfalls that we saw organizations make early in the pandemic when they leaned in with maybe a bit too much confidence and certainty around, you know, returning to work. And we saw how that backfired. And so if they had practiced some soft skills around empathy, 
listening, being curious about who's not in the room and some of those decisions, um, they could be more resilient the next time around. <laughs> and I love that um, who's not in the room. And I would add the the small version of who's in the room, but not participating. Mm. And what can we do in the silence? If, if people are silent in a room, it's the number one indicator that they're not feeling included. Mm -hmm. So they were physically included, but not not included in the meaningful way. And there's lots of things we can do to be helpful to draw that out. Absolutely. Great. Um, well, now's a great time to, to bring some audience questions um, into the conversation. Um, and, you know, we have some really great questions that have been surfaced in the chat. Um, and as always, we have more questions than we have time to answer. Um, so I'll do my best to prioritize the ones um, most relevant to the, the broader audience and that, that also feel additive to some of the stuff that we've already been in conversation about. Um, there is uh, a lot of, there's some overlapping questions around like strategies for getting senior leaders to listen. So um, some curiosity around like how folks can influence senior leaders, um, you know, folks who maybe are incumbents um, and maybe if they're working in a context where um, leaders aren't practicing um, human-centered leadership as much, what are some um, strategies, advice you might offer um, to folks who are desiring um, some tips for influencing leaders to lead um, through from a place more of empowerment of others? I'll, I'll offer two. Um, the first one is, um, I'm a very big fan of positive reinforcement. I call it Scooby Snacks, but, um, and so for a leader that doesn't often um, show human center, anytime they do, I'd give them a Scooby Snack. So even on the rare moments that they do do it, I would give them positive reinforcement to, and then be super specific about why it was helpful. Because they might not do it because they don't understand it. They don't understand they have the capacity. So if you catch them doing it right, I would draw sincere and specific attention to that. That's one thing. The other thing is I really want to try to create a performance pull. So, you know, leaders, particularly the senior leaders, um, they care about the performance of many stakeholders. And so I would pick whichever one seems to be most important to them at the moment. And I would show them the map to by how doing this will increase the area of performance they care most about. The beautiful thing about the stuff we're talking about right now is it improves every single measure of performance. If it's achievement, if it's sentiment, if it's financial, if it's for partners, it really it does it for all of them. So I would catch them doing it right and figure out which aspect of performance they most care about and try to draw the diagram for them on how to use this as leverage to improve that type of important performance and then mm -hmm. and then try to get them to want it. I think a couple of things that I've probably tried personally, um, one is just remembering that there's scale in numbers. Um, and so if there, you know, are large parts of the community that feel a certain way about something that hasn't changed and or a leader that hasn't engaged in a certain way, um, find a way to communicate that scale. I think quite often leaders hear, you know, one-off stories and they might assign them to one or two people and not realize it's something that, no, this is, you know, impacting a majority of employees. So is there a way that you can capture that feedback at scale, be it through a survey, be it through a communication that you invite that leader to a conversation? That's one thing that I've tried in the past, just to kind of really, you know, put, on a stage, really, frankly, and kind of in their faces that, um, you know, this is something that's impacting leaders and also, mm -hmm. or sorry, impacting the community and also showing that it's impacting the community enough that people are taking leadership of that piece of the conversation, that people um, within the community are taking on that accountability because they want to see that change. Um, something else you might consider, frankly, is just bringing in external experts. Um, sometimes it's hard for leaders to hear within their own organization. And so sometimes just bringing in someone from the outside to reflect back to them, hey, here's what I'm seeing. And here are some best practices from other organizations around how you might change that. That's something that I've seen really accelerate um, engagement from some of our leaders. 
And the thing I've seen Lauren do in particular that's really great is when you invite them into the community, you've curated the space for the community to come in. And it's not, um, I mean, it's a soft intervention. It's not a, a, a hard intervention. It's not a gotcha. It's just for you to be exposed to it. And it does take some really lovely thought. And it's it's not to... There, there's no hard edge to it. It's, it's got super high standards, but it also has the thing that we find really matters. It's got deep devotion to that leader too. It's not us against you. And so I think lovingly curating that environment for them to be exposed to the scale of the community. Um, I have watched Lauren do that and it, and it works like really quickly. Mm -hmm. I would say too, if I could, Ariana is just remembering that these leaders are just humans. <laughs> they were in the seats that a lot of us are in or were in at some point, you know, they have personalities themselves, they have insecurities themselves. And so um, to the point Francis made inviting them into the conversation to be part of it as another community member is really important. I think about, um, we had a conversation around introversion here in Chicago, a couple of years that I lovingly curate and design, like you said, Francis, and was surprised that our two most senior leaders came into that space because they self-identified as introverts and they were able to join the rest of the community and be in that conversation and talk about how we might change the culture to be more accommodating to introverts um, in a way that none of us had expected because, because we felt like, you know, we had to do this ourselves when really, we really just need to invite them into the conversation. Mm -hmm. I love this example you're bringing up Lauren too, because we have some great questions in the chat about, um, how to create room for active listening um, when there might be introverts or more quiet folks um, in a meeting. Um, and some folks are offering great questions around, um, you know, how we might encourage those people who are quiet in the room to contribute, um, or what are some um, concrete examples of questions or prompts that might get those folks who need a little bit more encouragement um, to participate and bring their voice into the conversation. I can tell you a couple of things that have that have worked um, in other contexts. So maybe they'll work in the context of folks that are listening. Um, one is that I often take note of who isn't speaking, um, and I'll I'll write down one to three names, um, and then I will meet with them outside of the meeting, and have a conversation with them. And I'm doing that super purposely so that the next time I'm in their me in the meeting with them, I can reference them by name for a positive journey I'm on. So that it's not even that they have to speak the first time. I can say, you know, Jack helped me to understand this. Mm -hmm. So I noticed mm -hmm. Jack was silent. I talked with him. Now I can reference him by name. It's an amazing thing that will happen. Once I positively reference someone by name, the likelihood that they will speak skyrockets. And then when they do speak, I wanna amplify their message by name. And so I think those sorts of things of, because I could try to prod them to speak, but I find that it most often helps if we get them in the, in the conversation in a positive and specific uh, way first. So that's one thing I found works. Another thing is when you ask a question and there's no answer, people are quick to move on, but that just means the extroverts didn't have an answer. So I do a soft and moder moderately slow count to 10 in my head before ever moving on from a question. And it is amazing what comes up at seconds seven, eight, and nine. And that's usually when the introverts um, come up. Those are great, Francis. I especially like the first one because you're really speaking as well to just attribution, which is um, you know a really key trait of an inclusive leader and to bring voices into the room that to your point might not be there. Um, a couple of tips I can think of. One is you might actually need to change the forum altogether. So um, as a self-proclaimed introvert, nothing is um, less exciting, frankly, than joining a large meeting <laughs> and, you know, having someone like ask me at a moment's notice what my opinion is. Um, and so some of the things that we've done um, at IDEO um, or I've done specifically um, have, again, changed that format up. So for example, maybe you start a meeting and what we call like more of a heads down moment. So you put a question up, you have, you know, post-its or Google slides, if you're, um, 
working remotely and you ask everyone, just take a couple of minutes and put your thoughts in the doc. And mm-hmm. then you start the conversation. So one, what you've done is you've given introverts time to process, time to think in our own heads um, and get our thoughts together, which is when we're most comfortable speaking. And then that invites us into the conversation. And it also allows um, folks to actually see what we're thinking, but we didn't have to give voice to it, right? I just had to give words to it. And so someone like my extroverted friends like Francis can say like, oh, I see someone here wrote this comment about X, Y, Z, you know, does anyone want to give more voice to that? And that makes it takes a lot of pressure off, um, you know, and again, just gives that time for processing space. Um, Something else we've done, if it's around questions, um, sometimes people are, again, just hesitant to have their name attached to stuff. So creating ways to answer a question or ask and answer questions anonymously. Um, Slido is a great tool that we've used um, and it's, you know, it's free to try it. So that's something else that people can explore as well offline. Those are great. Oh, such great examples. Um, and I love how uh, affirmational uh, all these comments are about introverts in the chat. Um, I, love, introverts. I love it. <laughs> and and to, be, to be clear, I too am an introvert. I just <laughs> happen to be good in front of large groups of people. It doesn't mean I'm not an introvert. <laughs> yes, I said my more extroverted friend. Yes, that's a very fair <laughs> statement. <laughs> um, well, we have a, a Switching gears a bit, we have a question um, in the chat um, from Bonnie um, that's kind of speaking about um, when kind of change is necessary, but others don't necessarily see it uh, yet. Um, And so Bonnie asked if you can discuss the kind of process of building trust when change is necessary, but the team doesn't necessarily see the logic um, behind it. Many tips around that. Yeah, so um, she's right, Bonnie is right that if we don't get this, we're not going to get the change. So mm-hmm. uh, we have to just keep trying and pivoting and trying and pivoting. I'll give a couple of vague <laughs> ideas and then uh, and then a specific one. But Bonnie probably understands something deeply, more deeply than everyone else, and that's how she sees that we have to change. Um, because she sees it and everyone else doesn't, she may not yet have learned how to describe it simply. So she probably understands it deeply and can only talk about it in a complicated way. And that's not going to communicate. That's going to be a very narrow set of people. So what we find is that the people that understand deeply, your next step is to describe it simply so that it's understood in your absence. And I think that's what, that's the challenge. That's the logic challenge for, Bonnie or if for her insight or for the insight of others. And no, I'm not questioning the insight. I'm sure it's right. Mm-hmm. But we have to make it self-evident to others in order for it to be a we th- a clear and compelling change mandate. And if we're required in the room to do it, it's just what when we're not in the room, people are going to slip back. Um, I usually think that if you can't do it in one sheet of paper, and it's probably not going to be all prose, and we're just not done. We're not done with our with our drafts. Now, the easiest way to do this is a line was going up and now it's going down. You know, a more there are more subtle ones, but I would also encourage people like Bonnie is seeing something. Is there a way to show it? Um, and I'd be super creative um, about it. But once others once others can see it as a clear and compelling change mandate in her absence, then we can go ahead and do it. So I would say mm-hmm. work on describing it more simply. Mm-hmm. I think that's great, Francis. The only thing I build is, um, you know, once you can start to employ others that can start to see it as well as bringing them into that creativity to help bring simplicity to the storytelling. Um, because you're right, Bonnie probably is one of the the early folks that can see it, but there are probably other people that can see inklings of it. And so how mm-hmm. can you employ them to help with the storytelling and help with lifting it up? And we know leaders ultimately care about performance and delivering results. And the more that you can connect, um, you know, that gap in trust or that gap in empathy with people's inability to do their jobs, do their jobs well, that might mm-hmm. also help the conversation. Mm-hmm. And, and once it is self-evident, then it will be great for Bonnie and her friends to um, the next task when people see it is to then work to design um, a, a, a vision, a way forward 
that's simultaneously rigorous and optimistic. Mm -hmm. And we really need both of them. Optimism without rigor is just not, it's just fluffy, but rigor without optimism is just as ineffective. So we have to be super creative and so that we can hit the mark on both of those. So while people are understanding it in your absence, the next step is to design a rigorous and optimistic way forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have about five minutes left and I, there's a question that's come in that um, I think kind of bridges um, the last two questions around um, sort of communicating um, change and uh, and getting folks on board with um, being able to communicate about that change right in their absence um, and also creating forums for listening and feedback. Um, someone named Lissy um, surfaced a question kind of around when, when venting happens or when folks um, are critical or cynical, right, about uh, about change and mentioned that um, in the context that they're in, um, they also use uh, asking questions anonymously, um, but it's often like because of the anonymity, it's a, a channel for venting or frustration to be shared. Um, and then there's kind of no way to follow up on it. Um, mm -hmm. And so would love to um, hear how um, y'all have kind of navigated addressing um, the like ways in which anonymity and creating forums for listening um, create room for folks to share um, anonymously, but then uh, what the process is for creating like a, a loop of communication on, on some of those concerns. So this one's going to be good because Lauren and I have different um, <laughs> opinions. I've thought it was generational. I'm just old, um, but we'll we'll see where it comes to here. And it's around Slack. So I don't want to put words in Lauren's mouth, but I find Slack to be very problematic because of the way it's used, not because of the technology, sorry, people, um, but the even though people's names are associated with it, we get seduced into thinking that you can behave in the way that of the anonymity of the internet like because we're in that forum mm -hmm. we really lose professionalism we lose giving people the benefit of the doubt we lose the edge of kindness um and we are it's almost like we're communicating with two-dimensional caricatures <clears throat> leaders well actually it's mary and Ariana and Lauren. And so I worry a lot about even Slack, which brings out the underbelly of anonymity, that when you actually get to anonymity, um, to your point, I think that there, I like it to be curated a little bit because I'm, I, <clears throat> just because someone voiced it, I don't want it to be aired. Um, mm -hmm. and people will voice stuff anonymous. I mean, we see it on the internet all the time, but I know that Lauren is very pro slack. So I want to pause and give that. <laughs> and I, and I think the punchline is I'm old, but let's go ahead go ahead, Lauren. <laughs> I didn't say that for the record. Francis said that, um, I I'm a multitasker. So slack allows me to do that. Um, you know, it's funny that you say that and that you reference slack in the specific question. So, we had a conversation with um, Slack early in the pandemic, and they let us know that we were using Slack wrong. So <laughs> I say that to say, I don't want to completely blame Slack. Like yeah. certainly the instant messenger communication does bring uh, the Twitter fingers in a way that we don't have um, uh, in other parts of the organization. And I definitely agree with you. Like anonymity does again, just bring this energy that maybe isn't always fair and or isn't always collaborative. So I think getting back to the question, Ariana, um, some of the things that I would think about one, I will say just hang in there. Uh, Lizzie, I think was the person that asked the question, like I have seen and observed the more that you create the space for, um, leaders to have conversation and to be answering the questions, the more you build trust. Um, and so even though it might feel like quite jarring to have all of those questions coming in or people venting in those spaces, one, still take that as a moment to listen. They're venting about something. There is something awry in the organization or awry in the employee's experience that's causing them to use that moment in time to do that. And certainly like we can't control everything, especially in 20 and 2021. Mm -hmm. um, but there might be things that you can hear that you can fix um, independent of those conversations. And the longer you mm -hmm. stick with it, the more that leaders are forthcoming, that they're honest with employees, um, that they are responsibly transparent 
parent, um, the less that tends to happen. So the worst thing that, um, I would say an organization can do is like the first time you get tough questions or hard comments is like shut down and be like, well, we can't do that again. Actually, it means that we need to stay engaged in the conversation and maybe we need to actually be having more conversation. Um, one small, like maybe tactical tip is to have agreements before those conversations and ask people to show up in a certain way. Um, you know, being kind with their words, making space for others, um, tell people how you would like for them to use the space. And even better, if you can co-create those agreements with the community, they're more likely to follow them. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that, that, that everything Lauren just said, I like, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. And I'm learning how to be young again. Um, uh, and we've seen organizations that have um, somebody from the community becomes a moderator, um, which is just to post every day. Here's our agreements. If things go outside of the agreements, the moderator comes back in and says, Hey, you know, mm -hmm. we're not calling out individuals by name. We're only doing these, like whatever the set of agreements are. Um, and I, I, I do like it. We weren't using Slack the right way. And I do think that like any technology, um, it has to be used the right way. Um, too often it's just poured in and, uh, to a company and just get, uh, gets going there. But I, mm -hmm. I would listen to Lauren on this one. I'll offer one last thing that in general, I find that when people provide prescriptions, they're not always great because they usually lack the c full context. But I find their underlying diagnosis is awesome. Mm -hmm. So when we listen to prescriptions, even if they're not kind, and even if they named somebody by name, and it was it, really listening to the underlying diagnosis, I think we'll learn a ton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so helpful. Um, and I just like appreciate so much all of the concrete examples y'all are offering. I think it really, um, hopefully we'll give tools some folks some tools and fuel um, to bring some of this into their unique context. Um, so we are uh, at time and so acknowledge, you know, that and if folks need to drop off, understand. But I also wanted to, you know, as we wrap, um, leave our listeners with some advice. Um, and an IDOU favorite is to ask panelists, um, what advice do you wish you'd received um, when you were just starting out mm -hmm. in your career? Um, so we'd love to close with that question. Oh, I have that one. I wish someone had told me that curiosity and judgment can't coexist. Mm -hmm. I grew up where judgment was a delicacy in my family, and it was just like an arms race who, who could be more judgmental of others. Um, and I, um, if you invite in curiosity, it pushes out judgment mm. so, and judgment. My being judgmental is my least favorite trait of mine. And if somebody had told me younger that the simple solution when I'm in a state of judgment is to invite in curiosity, I it would have saved me a lot of heartache. Mm, I like that. I will take that as an adult. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think, you know, I wish someone would have said to me much younger in my career, speak up, speak up, like, mm. uh, just share what's on your mind. Um, I spent so much of my youth just worried about saying the wrong thing, or like I mentioned early filtering what I was saying, or, um, feeling like I was too young or too inexperienced or too something in order for my voice to really matter. Um, mm in the workplace and in the organization. And I just look at some of these young people. Now I look at Greta, I look at the poet, Amanda, and I'm just, my mind is blown um, by these young people and how they're leveraging their voices um, to literally change the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's something that we're all capable of literally with just our voice. Oh, such beautiful insights. Goosebumps. <laughs> Um, well, Francis and Lauren, this has been wonderful. Um, thank you both so much um, for all of your insights today. And thank you so much to our audience for your wonderful questions and for joining us today. 
Um, super hopeful that this conversation has given you some, you know, creative fuel um, to bring back to the leadership context you're navigating out in the world. Um, and if you'd like to continue to grow your leadership practice, I invite you to check out IDOU's course, Leading for Creativity. Um, and also uh, you can learn more um, at idou.com slash leading. Um, thank you so much and see you next time. You you uh, curated a beautiful conversation, Ariana. I'm grateful to have been included. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Ariana. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everyone.